You're watching NASA TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'm NASA's Sandra Jones. Thank you for joining us for today's briefing to preview an upcoming spacewalk scheduled for Sunday, September 12th aboard the International Space Station. This will be the 244th spacewalk in support of International Space Station assembly, maintenance, and upgrades, and the first involving two international partners out of the Quest airlock. European Space Agency astronaut Toma Pesquet and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut and current space station commander Aki Hoshide are scheduled to conduct this EVA. This briefing will address the programmatic and operational significance of the spacewalk, as well as all the detailed procedures. Based off of updated COVID guidance, each of our briefers are located in separate rooms more than six feet apart and are not required to wear masks because of this. Our briefers today do include Dana Weigel, Deputy Manager of the International Space Station Program, Addie Bulos, Spacewalk Flight Director, and Sandy Moore, Spacewalk Officer. We'll first start with some initial remarks from each of our briefers before opening it up for questions. We'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as on our social media platforms. If you're on the phone, please press star one to add your name to our queue and ask a question. And if you're on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA to submit your question. We'll now begin with opening comments from Dana Weigel. Thank you. Let's see, it's been a busy summer for us on Space Station. We've got seven crew members on board, three NASA crew, one JAXA, one ESA, and two Roscosmos. Um, with the recent arrival of SpaceX 23 on August 30th, the crew's been really busy doing science, hardware upgrades, and cargo logistics. Uh, the SpaceX mission brought with it 4,800 pounds of cargo, so a lot of, a lot of cargo to transfer. Uh, about a month ago, we had the NG-16 Cygnus vehicle arrive, and it brought with it 8,200 pounds of cargo. Uh, and on that flight was the solar array modification kit that you'll hear more about in today's briefing that'll be installed uh, on Sunday's EVA. Uh, NG-16 also brought up an interesting new carbon dioxide removal technology that's called the four-bed CO2 scrubber, and we're hoping to install that on orbit in the next few weeks. The Russians have also been very busy, and this last week they had two spacewalks to connect power and data cables to the MLM and also to do some outfitting on the outside of their MLM. And then earlier this summer, we conducted three spacewalks to install two new IROSA solar arrays. And if I could get the image of those uh, arrays. We upgraded our 2B and our 4B power channels. Those are shown in the image on the far right side. They're doing fantastic. Uh, in total, we do plan to upgrade six of the eight power channels, as you can see here in this image. The new IROSA solar arrays are installed on top of the old arrays at about a 10 degree offset angle. The, uh, the exposed portion of the old legacy array combined with the new solar array work together to generate the power for the channel. And each one of those upgraded power channels produces as much or more power uh, compared to the legacy arrays when they were brand new. Sunday's spacewalk prepares the 4A channel for a future IROSA upgrade. The 4A channel is the third in the cluster there on the right-hand side. Um, a modification kit will be installed at the base of the old legacy array during the EVA. And then the crew will also do a replacement of a floating potential measurement unit, or FPMU, which has a degraded power supply. We use that FPMU to measure the electrical potential difference between the space station conductive structures and the plasma environment that we're flying through. Um, as was mentioned, the EVAs will be conducted by Aki Hoshide and Tama Pesquet. And just as a point of interest, this is the first EVA from the Quest airlock that'll be conducted by two international partner astronauts. And with that, I will hand it over to Addy. Thank you, Dana. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Addy Bulos. I have the honor and pleasure of being the lead flight director for this upcoming spacewalk on Sunday. 
And uh, for the past couple months, our focus here on the ground and in space has been to make sure that uh, Akihushire and Toma Pesque have everything they need in order to successfully complete the tasks assigned to them in this uh, spacewalk. Uh, spacewalks are extremely complex. They take a lot of, uh, a lot of people's focus and, and time to ensure that we have everything we need to safely accomplish them. We are essentially putting our astronauts into their own little space vehicles and uh, assigning them very complex tasks to perform in a very short amount of time that require a lot of physical dexterity and a lot of engineering skills to accomplish. Uh, we've been working very hard the past couple of months to refine our, our procedures for the crew uh, by running simulations and uh, performing runs in our natural buoyancy laboratory here in Houston. Um, I'm extremely proud and uh, uh, excited for this uh, EVA, and our teams have done a phenomenal job getting ready, and uh, our operations team is ready to execute on, on Sunday. And with that, I'll hand it over to our uh, spacewalk lead officer, or EVA lead, Sandy Moore. Thank you, Addy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandy Moore, and I am the lead EVA officer for Sunday's EVA. Uh, as mentioned, US EVA 77 will be executed by JAXA astronaut Aki Hashode and European astronaut Tomal Pesquet. Also helping us out will be Megan MacArthur and Mark Vandehei. They're going to suit up our crew uh, throughout the morning. And here in Mission Control, we'll have US astronaut Jessica Watkins helping guide us through our procedures. The crew are going to start off very early on Sunday morning, around 2 a.m. Central Standard Time, uh, beginning their EVA preparations. Around 4.30 a.m., they'll begin their in-suit light exercise. Much like the name suggests, this is where crew don their spacesuit, uh, start to begin uh, breathing pure O2, or oxygen, and performing a set of light exercise. Uh, this helps jostle any extra nitrogen out of the system before depress. Uh, at that time, when it's complete, Mark and Megan will take the crew off the wall and don their simplified aid for EVA rescue and put the crew in the airlock for depress. On US EVA 77, we will be conducting a unique airlock depress test. This will involve the extravehicular hatch, manual pressure equalization valve, and this is in prep for upcoming airlock upgrades. Uh, this test will extend depress by about 20 minutes, so we expect egress around 7.35 Central Standard Time. Up next, I'm going to provide with you an animation and step through all the EVA tasks step by step. US EVA 77 will begin at the Quest airlock. JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide EV-1, noted by the red stripes, will egress first and receive and hold the eight-foot mod kit strut bag. European astronaut Tama Pesquet will egress second with the full white suit, take control of the large bag on his body restraint tether, and head out to P4. He will pause momentarily to drop his fairly green hook, just nadir of the flex hose rotary coupler, the FHRC, and then continue translation to P4. Back at the airlock, EV-1 Aki Hoshide will retrieve his worksite interface extender, or WIFX, and follow Tamal out to P4. He will also pause to drop his fairly green hook, just nadir of the FHRC. While Tamal is stowing the very large strut bag at P4, Aki will complete his translation out to the P4 beta gimbal assembly where he will install and set up his WIFX. He will then translate over to P5 to retrieve a foot restraint on his body restraint tether. He will return back to P4 to set up his foot restraint and the WIF extender and optimize for position. Aki will then translate over to Tama to begin assembling the ISS rollout solar array mod kit upper triangle. Tama and Aki will work as a team to build the triangular segment loosely and then will tighten the structure by driving the bolts to torque. Aki will then translate over to and ingress the foot restraint. Tama will hand off the upper triangle to Aki. Aki will lean back soft dock the structure to the beta gimbal assembly and drive four bolts. Once complete with the upper triangle, Aki will egress the foot restraint, bias it to the left hand side, while Tamal prepares to hand off the left mid strut for BRT stow. Aki will ingress the APFR and hold the lower strut, while Tamal repositions 
to the Solar Array blanket box for sob bearing to install the left lower strut. Tamal will begin driving this bolt by hand four turns while Aki aligns his end and drives his to the mounting bracket two turns. Tamal will finish his bolt by driving it with the pistol grip tool, followed by high torque with the EVA torque wrench. Once the bolt is deemed good, Aki will be given a go to drive his bolt to torque using the pistol grip tool. This will complete our minimum config for the mod kit. Tamal will translate on the beta gimbal assembly, and Aki will hand off his telescoping mid strut for install. Tamal will work to soft dock the side pad to the BGA while Aki holds his clevis bolt side in place. Tamal will start four bolts by hand, followed by the pistol grip tool. Aki will then drive his bolt to torque on the mounting bracket. Tamal will then gather tools and reset for the right hand side by bringing tools back to the bag while Aki egresses and repositions the foot restraint to bias it to the right side. Aki will ingress the foot restraints and the crew will repeat the handoff. First the mid strut for BRT stow and then the long lower right strut. Tomal will then reposition to the right hand side for the four alpha gimbal assembly and the analogous install strategy will unfold. Tomal will position at the right side bearing for lower strut install and then over onto the BGA for the mid strut install. Tamal will translate on the mid strut and drive two collar bolts to torque, rigidizing the telescoping mechanism on the right hand side. Once complete, the crew will install the multi layer insulation, and then Tamal will position to the left hand side to repeat. Aki will egress the foot restraint and begin cleanup. He will retrieve and stow all the tools, fold the bag in thirds, and stow on his body restraint tether. The crew will meet up and hand off tools for the next task, the floating potential measurement unit, remove and replace. And in prep for that task, Tamal will translate and retrieve a foot restraint with X combo on his body restraint tether. Aki will be the first to head inboard. He will follow his tether back to the airlock underneath the MT, and down the seat of spur. At the airlock, the crew will open the thermal cover, stow the strut bag, and exchange it for the spare FPMU. Meanwhile, Tamal will head inboard with his foot restraint, pause momentarily at the FHRC, and then go zenith across the zenith handrail over to the P1 FPMU. Tamal will pause momentarily to put in an EVA electrical inhibit by pulling a NASA Zero G lever electrical connector aft and then install the foot restraint at the work site. He will work to position it to the desired position and then ingress for prep for FPMU removal. Aki will translate back to face one, going up the seat of spur under the MT and then Zenith at the FHRC and meet Tama at the FPMU at P1. He will stow the spare in a location optimal for handoff. During this time, Tama will tether to the FPMU and begin driving bolts. Two outer and then one center with the pistol grip tool. He'll stow that and then install a handling aid called a scoop for ease and removal of this unique orbital replacement unit, or ORU. Tamal will position the FPMU to allow Aki to stow the probes. Aki will slide a collar out of the way, depress a lever, and lower the probes into place. He will use a taped wire tie to keep them in the stowed location. For ease, the failed FPMU will be stowed on Tamal's body restraint tether. Aki will then retrieve the spare from the bag, tether and remove the wire tie and deploy the probes. They will hand off and reinstall the spare into the stanchion, driving the center bolt followed by the two outer bolts. Once complete, the team will work to stow the failed unit into the ORU thermal bag and stow on Aki's body restraint tether. 
Aki will then follow his tether back to the airlock and stow the failed FPMU in the airlock. Tamal will work to clean up the worksite by egressing the foot restraint and plugging in the EVA electrical inhibit by moving the lever fully forward. He will retrieve his foot restraint on his body restraint tether. He will follow his tether back to the airlock. Under the MT, he will pause momentarily to stow the foot restraint in the starboard CETA cart for an upcoming EVA, and then translate down the CETA spur to the airlock for a successful completion of US EVA 77. Thanks to our briefers for those initial remarks. We'll now open it up for questions. Again, if you're on our phone bridge, please press star one to submit a question. Once your name is called, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question. If you find that your question has already been answered, press star two to withdraw it. And on social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA to submit your question. Let's start on our phone bridge with Martha. Marcia Smith with Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much. This is Marcia Smith with SpacePolicyOnline.com, as you said. And I'm curious as to why Pesquet was chosen to replace Vanda High instead of one of the NASA astronauts. Was he trained for this uh, before he went up to the space station, or how was he that uh, that he drew the lucky straw? And uh, how is Vanda High doing? When do you anticipate that he'll be ready to do a spacewalk again? Dana, would you like to take that question? Sure, I can take that question. Um, let's see, you had a couple questions there. Um, first off, when we prepare for an EVA, it takes us a, a few weeks to get the specific suits ready and to do checkouts. Um, we also have the SpaceX 23 mission ongoing, and so we needed to make an early decision for which specific suits. You know, we've got to do sizing for the suits, as an example, and we've got to do um, preparations and checkouts. And so we needed to make that decision early. And so we decided that we wouldn't send Mark out and we'd let him continue to just kind of rest and recover from the, the pinch nerve that he's he's shared with everyone. Um, in terms of how we pick crew members, um, the training is, is no different. We're, we're very much an international crew. And on the US segment, JAXA, ESA, and NASA crew members, they all get the same EVA training. So if they're EVA qualified, there's no difference at all between the different crew members. In this particular case, um, it happened to be that Tomas' suit and his suit fit was a little easier in terms of the overall timeline to accommodate. And so it, it worked out best for Tomas to go out with Aki. Thanks, Dana. And we do have some social media questions coming in. One of our Twitter users asks, how long do spacewalks normally last? Sandy, could you address this one? I can. Uh, we typically plan spacewalks for six hours and 30 minutes, and we do that on purpose. Uh, that is a number generated by the amount of consumables we have in our spacesuits, uh, plus a little bit of buffer, so we have protection for our crew members uh, in case something holds us up. So we have a, about 30 minutes of buffer on each of our, our consumables to keep our crew members safe and, and healthy and happy. Uh, so thanks for the question. Thanks, Sandy. We have another question from Mark Corot with Aviation Week. Yes, thank you. I think this is for uh, Don, Donna. Um, when does the, uh, approximately anyway, uh, the next uh, IROSA's launch to the space station? And currently, when do you envision having all six of the uh, upgraded arrays installed, even on a rough time frame? Um, we're still working on the specific manifest plan, but in terms of hardware availability and delivery, we'll be ready to fly the next pair at the end of 22. So assuming from a manifest standpoint, that's, that's what we choose to do. We'd be ready to fly them then. Um, we don't need them specifically at that point in time. So part of it is a strategy of prioritizing our external cargo, if we have payload customers who are ready, we may choose to shuffle and, and push some things around. Um, we would like to get them done, though, in the next few years. So I think we'll see probably late 22, 23, the next set, and then perhaps by the end of 23 is a ballpark time frame for the last set. 
Thanks, Dana. We have a Twitter user that has asked what astronauts inside the space station will do to help the spacewalkers. Addy, would you like to answer this one? Yeah, sure. So uh, some spacewalks, we have uh, robotics operations going on uh, that require the internal crew members to help out with and, and control the arm. Uh, for this spacewalk, we actually don't have any uh, robotics operations that require the crew to help out with from the inside. Uh, they'll really, their main tasks this time around are to uh, help the crew suit up, so help uh, Aki and Tomas suit up and, and get ready to go outside and, and just follow along, uh, to make sure they're ready to go in case uh, we have to get the, the crew back inside quickly that they're ready to, to support and, and assist. Um, we're also going to have a, a normal day for, for some of our crew members where they're going to be doing some, uh, some payloads and some uh, maintenance activities on the inside while, the, while Aki and Tamar are outside doing their spacewalk. So uh, it's a mixed bag of things of, of either helping Tamar and Aki get, get suited up and, and get uh, back inside or they're just going to be having a normal day for the most part. Thanks, Addy. Our next question is from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi. Um Question from Addy, just uh, following up on something you just said about there not being any robotics that the crew in, on the space station will be controlling. But there was an earlier mention that ISS Experience would be out for this spacewalk. Um, will that be controlled by robotics from the ground, or where will that camera be positioned, and will there be any interaction between uh, Tomas and Aki and, um, and that camera for the purpose of, the, of, of their filming? Yeah, absolutely. Great question there. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the robotics activities that we'll be performing will not be controlled by the, the crew members on board. They'll actually be controlled by uh, our robotics officer here in MCC uh, Houston. Uh, we'll have the ISS experience camera outside, which is a, a 3D um, camera that will create some great pictures of the of the crew while uh, the crew is doing a spacewalk outside and uh, bring those down in high def for, for the world to see. Uh, but the, that camera will be controlled entirely by the robotics on the ground. And uh, it, it's, the procedures are developed in a way where the camera will be completely out of the path of the, the spacewalkers. Uh, they, for the most part, they'll just know where the camera is, but they don't have to work around it or, or go out of their way to avoid the camera. So we made sure that the camera uh, gets some amazing views. However, it doesn't interfere at all with our, our spacewalk tasks themselves. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Adi. We do have some more social media questions coming in. This one from Carol on Twitter who asks, how long does it take to prep for a spacewalk? Sandy, will you take this one? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. There's different ways you can look at that. So if you mean prep from the time you come in as an ASCAN, it actually takes several years to, to get ready. Um, if you mean on board, it, it takes just several hours. So I'll address the first one first. And then crew come in as an ASCAN. Uh, we'll teach them to use the suit in our neut neutral buoyancy lab here in Houston. Uh, they start off with just understanding the basics, and we work them up to uh, know how to do almost any EVA that could be thrown their way. Um, once they've passed all, all their tests in the pool, they are a certified EVA crew member and can fly to space. Uh, and then once they're on board, uh, we see where the EVAs fall and what the timeline allows, and then they are assigned an EVA. Uh, once on EVA morning, as mentioned earlier today, we'll start around 2 a.m. and we go out the door about um, four and a half hours later, five hours later, depending on how the day goes. Uh, so that's how long it takes to get ready in the morning. Thanks, Sandy. Another question we have on the phone bridge is from Marsha Smith with Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much for giving me a second question. I was wondering if Dana could bring us up to date on the state of the space station overall and the smell of smoke that uh, was noticed in the Russian segment. Have they tracked that down yet? And the leaks that they've been having on the space station, I know that they're still trying to find those and fix those. Could you just give us a, an overview of how the space station is doing a, as a facility? Sure. Uh, overall, space station's doing very well. I'll start with the, the leak first. Um, the Russians have left the hatch closed. There hasn't been any recent troubleshooting to date on the leak. I think probably you're aware that uh, a couple months ago, um, there was a little bit of work trying to find additional leaks. Of course, quite a while ago, they did identify um, two leak locations that were patched and fixed, but they've still got 
another small leak location that um, is very tiny and has been hard for them to find. And so their focus uh, recently has been on the MLM on board, but what is happening between the ground teams is a lot of discussions about next steps for troubleshooting. One of the things that's on the horizon that we will do soon is install a set of strain gauges into the uh, the PARCA, which is the name of the module on the aft end of the service module, sorry, the tunnel on the aft end of the service module that, that has this, this small leak. Those strain gauges will help us collect data and better understand um, the loads that are going in there. And then the Russians also plan to do some additional uh, troubleshooting where they try to seal off additional areas to find the leak. But the leak rate remains small and stable, and so it hasn't changed, it hasn't progressed, and so they'll pick that back up uh, when they're done with all the MLM activities. Um, let's see, you asked about the uh, night before last, uh, we had a, a Russian smoke alarm on the vehicle that went off during crew sleep. The crew got up. Um, they use their, they've got monitoring devices to go check the atmosphere. The atmosphere looked fine, but they could smell something um, that smelled a little bit like a uh, kind of a, a plastic, uh, kind of plastic burning type odor, maybe what you'd experience with like a wire or insulation on a wire. Um, the Russians have been taking a, a look at it. They think they might understand um, the correlation there as they had a piece of equipment running that they subsequently um, turned off and then the smell um, didn't increase and started to go away. They did scrub the atmosphere a little bit. So I think we'd have to ask the, uh, the Russians for more details on that, but uh, everything is returned back to normal and they haven't had any recurrence of any issues. So everything is stable and great on board. Thanks, Dana. We have another social media question from John on Twitter who wants to know how an astronaut is protected from debris or space objects. Sandy Moore, would you like to talk a bit about how the suit provides that protection? Sure, I can do that. Uh, so if you ever take a look at the spacesuit, uh, it has many, many different layers. And these layers offer protection for several different things. Um, one is to help keep the temperature. It also keeps the pressure to help keep them alive. But it has several layers also to protect them from something we call micrometeorite debris. And so if there's any sort of small, tiny particles, this will help prevent them through several layers of insulation from encountering our crew. And so that is how we protect our crew from any sort of tiny space debris that's outside. Thanks, Sandy. Another question on the phone bridge comes from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi. Um, following up on something uh, Dana said earlier about um, all, all USOS astronauts being trained similarly on spacewalks, does it surprise you that it's taken more than 20 years for um, a spacewalk to occur with two international partners and, um, and, and no American astronauts outside? And if um, if Mark hadn't suffered an injury, um, do you think that uh, we would have seen, or do, do you know if in the future manifest we will see another um, all-international partner EVA in the near future? That's a great question. Um, I, I think you're aware that the way our crew members, you know, with the balance of contribution, the complement of crew members we have on board, um, always has more NASA crew members. And so just statistically speaking, um, it makes sense that you usually end up with a NASA crew member. There's no requirement for that, and that's certainly not um, a ground rule for, for planning. Um, we do usually have a certain subset of our crew who are qualified to be EVA. You know, there's a lot of different roles on board, robotic operator, specialists in different areas. And so ideally what we like to do with the astronaut corps is um, cycle through or give opportunities to um, the collection of crew members who are on board. So that's more the strategy than it is specifically about trying to um, pair together NASA or JAXA or ESA specifically. Um, I'm not sure that we have anything planned. I feel very fortunate right now that the complement we have is such a mixed and diverse crew. In some cases, we haven't had that type of a mix. And of course, now that we have four USOS crew members on board, whereas when we were flying on Soyuz, we only had three, we have a higher likelihood of seeing something like this again. 
Thanks, Dana. That was our last question for today. So thank you to all who submitted questions and a big thanks to today's briefers for taking the time out of their schedule to discuss the upcoming spacewalk. We hope we'll see you again this weekend during the spacewalk. NASA TV coverage will begin at 6 a.m. Central Time this Sunday. Thanks again for joining us. That will wrap up today's briefing. Thank you.